Okay. I'd like us again, please, to go one more time to John 9. John chapter 9. I want to read from verse 26 to the end of the chapter. And we want to consider this evening blind leaders. Blind leaders. Often we hear that phrase, blind leaders of the blind. Well, perhaps this is where that thought came from. Beginning in verse 26, it says, Then said they to him again, What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you did not hear. Wherefore would ye hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? And they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses, As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshipper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. Again, Lord will bless that reading from his precious word to us uh, this evening. So we're in this interrogation process, as you recall, the blind man, both he was interrogated, his parents were interrogated, and now they've come back to him. And uh, the religious leadership are once again resuming this interrogation. And uh, they say to him again, in verse 26, then said they to him again, what did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? It's ironic in one sense that they recognize that his eyes were opened. They recognize that Jesus did it, but they still are asking, well, how? They want to know all about how it happened instead of just uh, acknowledging the fact that an amazing miracle had taken place and considering that miracle and considering the one who had done it. But no, they, they're so caught up with this question of how. And so it says, verse 27, he answered them. And you get the impression here at this stage that this man is getting really tired of their interrogation. And he answered them, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. In other words, you guys are just not listening. <laughs> You're not paying attention. I've told you before. Wherefore, would ye hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? In other words, he's using incredible sarcasm here. But uh, he's basically uh, saying to them, the fact that you keep on asking, maybe you're seeking him. Maybe you're actually showing an interest in becoming one of his disciples. And, of course, they do not like uh, his sarcastic response uh, to them. Uh, again, coming out of just weariness at their incessant questioning, which had by now exhausted his patience. And so what do they do? Verse 28, it says, then they reviled him. Now, not going to be too long, and they're not going to be just reviling this man they're going to be reviling the son of God himself and they're reviling him. And so it's often been said that when you do not have a case, 
you abuse the plaintiff. <laughs> in other words, the only way that you just harass the person and you abuse them. And that's what's happening here. They really do not have a, a case. Uh, they'd utterly failed to shake the testimony of this man. And so instead, they begin to abuse him, verbally abuse him. They accused him of being a disciple of Jesus, uh, as if that was the worst possible thing in the world. And they also uh, say that they were Moses' disciples, as if that was the greatest possible thing in the world. But this idea of reviling, I want us just to think about this word reviled. It actually is going to tell us, First Peter would tell us, when he was reviled, the Lord Jesus, he reviled not again, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. So what does that really mean? That literally is to rail at somebody, and it, means, it literally means to subject someone to verbal abuse. And so they'd gone beyond the word of questioning now, and they're just verbally abusing this man. And I want you just to pay attention to that. These men were supposed to be the shepherds of Israel, and this man was meant to be one of their flock. And what are they doing? This is important because we're setting the scene for the next chapter. In the next chapter, we're going to have a contrast between these blind leaders who were abusive uh, to their flock with the good shepherd who is going to lay down his life for the flock. And so why this little section in chapter nine is so important is that it, it beautifully paves the way for the glories of chapter 10 and the introduction of, of the good shepherd. But these are abusive shepherds. They're abusing this man, uh, railing upon him, uh, casting insults upon him, uh, verbally abusing him. Uh, and uh, again, because they don't have any argument against the evidence that is being presented. And so instead, they lash out at the man. And then in verse uh, 29, they assert, we know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. And it's not because of lack of information, because he has repeatedly told them, as we have witnessed, that he came down from heaven, that his father sent him. But we don't know where this guy's from. We, we know Moses. We know all about him, uh, but we don't know this one. And so, again, they, uh, they just, again, refusing to listen, really. They do not have ears to hear either what this man is saying or what the Lord has been saying. They're so set in their way that it's like they cannot hear, and later on we're going to see, not only can they not hear, but they can't see. They're blind and dumb, really, to the facts that have been uh, really screaming at them in the face, and yet they can't hear them. Uh, such is uh, their terrible state. And of course, part of the, uh, the reason that they're lashing out here is because they, in their thinking, uh, they feel that Jesus broke the law of Moses by performing this miracle, as we saw last time, on the Sabbath day. And in their estimation, it's impossible to be a disciple of both Moses and Jesus. It's either or, one or the other. And so you're his disciple, we're Moses' disciples, and this is what they're stressing. And of course, they do not believe that the Lord Jesus is worthy of listening to because in their minds, he's broken the law of Moses by doing this miracle uh, on the Sabbath day. So we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. And so in verse 30, the man answered and said unto them, why herein is a marvelous thing that you know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. And it was, are you not even thinking about the evidence? Like, like this amazing miracle. I was born blind. He's opened my eyes. And you're not even willing to consider that. Now, he says in verse 31, we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. And so, again, just clearly stating that, in a very pragmatic way, 
his logic goes like this. According to the assumption of the Jews, God does not listen to sinners. And yet, clearly, God has allowed Jesus to be able to heal this man who was blind. So how, how could Jesus have performed this miracle if he was under divine condemnation? Now, where, where did the Jews have this assumption of that God heareth not sinners? And we want to kind of think about this for a moment. I'd like us to go back, please, to Psalm 66. We want to look at several scriptures. Many of them we're very familiar with. We may have even used them ourselves. Uh, Psalm 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And so, again, the implication being, if the Lord Jesus was the sinner that they were implying, the lawbreaker, then uh, how did this miracle occur? Because clearly uh, God heard him and uh, the uh, healing took place. Look at Proverbs, please. Chapter 28. Just this kind of idea that God doesn't listen to the prayers of sinners. And we want to analyze that a little bit further, but it says, he that turneth away his ear, this is verse 9 of Proverbs 28, he that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. And so the idea is that if he's not listening to God's law, and of course, if in their minds, Jesus is a Sabbath breaker, he's not listening to God's law, then even his prayer would be an abomination. So how could this work uh, is the man's assertion, if that's the case. Isaiah chapter 1, one more reference. Uh, well, we consider why the Jews came to this conclusion of God not hearing sinners. <clears throat> Isaiah 1, 15. Sorry, I said 5. 1 verse 15. When you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear your hands are full of blood and so uh, again we've got this clear statements that god doesn't listen uh, to sinners and so of course uh, this man is saying to the so-called teachers uh, we know that god hears not sinners if any man be a worshiper of god he does his will him he, he heareth <clears throat> and so of course it leads us to this question is it a true statement that this man is making that God does not hear sinners? Because I've heard many a Christian say that, that God does not hear the prayers of the unsaved. And I think you've got to be careful when you make those statements. I would modify that statement and say this. God does not hear the prayers of unrepentant sinners but he does i mean how does anybody get saved if god doesn't hear the prayers of sinners can you tell me that please uh, whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved and who needs to call on the name of the lord to be saved but sinners right uh, and so clearly uh, when you get saved at some point you may have said lord I'm the sinner you died to save, save me. And so what we might say is he doesn't hear unrepentant sinners, but sincere seeking repentant sinners. God definitely hears their prayer. In fact, I can prove it to you clearly from the word of God. Now, I want you to look, please, at the book of Acts for a moment in chapter 10. And I think this case is a fascinating case in the Word of God. <clears throat> Acts chapter 10, verse 4, where it says this, <clears throat> And when he looked on him, this is the angel, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Thy prayers... And thine arms are come up for a memorial before God. So Cornelius' prayers are coming up, and his, and his good works are coming up. His arms giving, his deeds are coming up for a memorial before God. God's got, he's got God's undivided attention. 
And of course, he, we know he's, he fears God. He's a devout man, but he's not a saved man. How do I know that? Look at the next chapter, please. Chapter 11 and verse 14. Let me read from verse 13. It says, he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said to him, send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter. Who shall tell the words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved? So you see that Cornelius, Peter was sent to him to give him words whereby him and his house might be saved. And of course, Peter preaches the gospel to him and he believes it, his house believes it and salvation comes to Cornelius's household. But God heard his prayer before he was saved. His prayers had come into the presence of God. And so again, I suggest to you that uh, this man, although what he's saying in the, in the Jewish context makes a lot of sense based on Isaiah 66 and all those other scriptures. But we would, we would want to be very careful before making a general statement that God does not hear the prayers of sinners. What we ought to say is that God always hears the prayers of, of repentant sinners <laughs> who are coming to the Lord and saying, Lord, save me. Whosoever calleth whatever they've done wherever they're from if they're calling on the name of the lord to be saved he hears that prayer and he answers it and praise god that he does i heard an amazing testimony of a guy who was uh not only high on drugs but stone drunk and <clears throat> on a, uh, in the midst of all that uh, he heard a gospel message and he called on the name of the Lord to be saved in his drunken state. And he said, the next morning I woke up and I knew I was a new creature. Isn't that amazing? And he's now a preacher. Uh, but again, sometimes we say, well, well, no point even preaching to somebody who's drunk. It's like casting pearls before swine. Well, <laughs> there are gonna be people in heaven that were saved under the influence. I know at least one. So, again, God does hear the prayer when somebody sincerely cries out to him. And are we glad that he does? And uh, what a wonderful thing it is. And yet, this man, using the logic that he has, he basically says to them, uh, we know that God hears not sinners. If a man be worshipped, God does his will, him he heareth. And then he says this, since the world began, it was not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind. This man realized that he was the first man in all of human history who had been born blind and he had received his sight. And he just couldn't understand how the Pharisees should witness such a marvelous event and find fault with the person who performed it. He just doesn't get it. How can, you not, how can you not see this? And so again, how do they respond? He says, verse 33, if this man were not of God, he could do nothing. Implication is that this, the Lord Jesus has done this, this thing to me or in such a marvelous way. He must be from God. How can you so quickly dismiss it? And so how, their response is, they answered and said to him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Two aspects to their response that I want us to see. First of all, it's clear they had no, clear, no real answer to what this man was saying. And so they once again resort to character assassination and made him feel unworthy to answer on behalf of Jesus. In other words, who are you to speak up? We know that you're altogether born in sins. Now, that takes us back to the beginning of the chapter. If you remember, even the disciples in chapter 9 and verse 2, his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And again, we know that was the kind of general teaching of the day. If somebody's born with some 
deformity or some difficulty either they sinned or their parents sinned and so they basically resort to that common held view and they attack this man assassinate his character and they just simply say that uh, because he was born blind it was evident that he was a sinner you were all together born in sins now in a sense this very scripture highlights their blindness doesn't it the law is going to say they're blind but one of the things they're blind to is the fact that every one of us was born in sins right even david in sin did my mother conceive me right uh, there's only one person who was born without the stain of original sin and that is the perfect son of god but every one of us were born in sins, right? We were all born sinners. And, and yet they said, this man, you was altogether born in sins. Implication being, we weren't. Now, if that's not blindness, I don't know what is, right? We weren't. We're, we're not like that. And of course, they could say, well, we, we didn't have any deformity. We didn't have any blindness. So therefore, we must be doing okay. And so they said, First of all, that was altogether born in sins. They uh, <clears throat> see that, uh, again, this poor man. And again, what kind of shepherds are they? Uh, railing on him, uh, insulting him, saying you're, uh, you're a sinner, altogether born in sins. And, and do you teach us? In other words, what right do you have to teach us uh, because of who you are? But then it says, they go a step further, and it says, they cast him out. They weren't willing to learn from this beggar, this formerly blind beggar, or from his experience. They insulted him, and then ultimately they excommunicated him. Isolating him from family, friends, and debarring him from employment. I don't know that we realize how significant excommunication was for Jewish people at this time. It meant that nobody would employ him because they would be, uh, as it were, condoning uh, his, uh, his sin. Uh, it meant that his family generally would disown him. Uh, we already saw his family were unwilling to say anything because they were scared they were going to get kicked out and so he could have no part in the religious service of the synagogue or in the ritual worship of the temple and anybody caught helping him would be exposing themselves to a similar fate so basically they're sentencing him to isolation in the community and uh, very very severe uh, thing that they are doing to this man they cast him out but i want you to notice the very next verse verse 35 jesus heard that they had cast him out and when he had found him notice what the lord jesus does it's, it's almost like the lord is saying to this man if they don't want you I'll gladly take you. He sought him out. He went to look for him and he found him. And isn't it wonderful? Many of us have experienced what it is to be rejected by our families and religious communities. But oh, it's so worth it when the Lord is the one who found us. <laughs> and it's better to have him and not have them than the opposite, to have them and not have him. And so what a wonderful, wonderful thing has happened that the Lord Jesus, the good shepherd, as opposed to these blind leaders, these cruel shepherds, he goes out to seek him. But he wants to be sure that this man understands who the Lord Jesus is as well as what he has done. And so when he finds him, he asks him a question. Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And uh, he, he, see, this man has to make a decision. 
even in the light of the rejection that he's had, he has to make a decision concerning the person of Christ. And of course, his faith must have a proper object. See, faith doesn't save. Faith in Christ saves, right? It's faith. There's a lot of people have faith. On the Titanic, the night it sank, there were people that had absolute faith in the engineers, the experts that had made this unsinkable ship. So much so they said God himself couldn't sink this ship. So even when it hit the iceberg, many of them just carried on as if nothing had happened because they were absolutely had incredible faith, but the faith was in the wrong object. A lot of people have faith, had faith and still have faith in communism, even though it's never worked anywhere. Uh, people have even given their lives for it, and it's making an amazing comeback even in the U.S. for sure. And you think to yourself, how would any thinking person do that? Well, they've got faith in it, <laughs> but their faith is in a very unworthy object. <laughs> faith has got to have a proper object. And so the Lord Jesus wants to make sure that this man, his faith, is in the right object. And so he asks him the question, do you believe in the Son of God? Now, I want to just stop here because there's a textual issue here. And that is this, that the critical text. Now, I want to just, I'm not going to get too technical here, but there's two kind of text texts that are out there. There's the majority text, which is the majority of manuscripts are all in full agreement. And I'm talking hundreds and hundreds of them. And then there's the critical text, which is based on three so-called older manuscripts, okay? These three older manuscripts don't even agree with each other, but somehow higher critics and their devotees love the critical text, and they think the critical text can do no wrong. And so the critical text says, do you believe in the Son of Man, okay? Whereas the majority text says, do you believe in the Son of God? Now, again, I just want to say this, the vast majority of textual evidence in terms of numeric support clearly supports Son of God. But these three older manuscripts in the critical text give Son of Man. Now, I want to show you why the Son of God has to be the right reading. And it's simply this. This is the reading that fits with the purpose of John's gospel. What was the point of these signs? Look at John 20 again, please. I know you know this, but the whole point of the signs in the gospel of John, including the healing of this blind man, was for one reason. Verse 30, many of John 20, many of the signs that tr truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, in that believing ye might have life through his name. Look, please, too, at John 11 and verse 27. Uh, just uh, let's back up to verse 24. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection in the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Whoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world and all through this gospel it's it's a revelation of the son of god the lord from heaven and and so i i have to deal with these things because they are issues maybe somebody's using the critical text uh translation based on the critical text but i have to say just from a personal point of view i have very little confidence in the critical text in fact, I don't have any. Three manuscripts, older, 
one found in a Vatican dustbin, the other one found in a Vatican library, another one in a monastery. Uh, that smells to begin with. Not worn out. Let me just say something here, and I'm going to leave this subject alone. Uh, these uh, most manuscripts were copied again and again, so they're the older manuscripts don't exist because they got worn out and they had to be recopied. I have a New World translation in my library. It's like brand new. And I've had it longer than I've had this Bible, which is already beginning to fade and die. <laughs> Why? Because I use it because I have confidence in it. But the one that's hardly damaged, I don't look at it hardly ever because I have no confidence in it whatsoever. And so, again, I don't want to spend the whole evening on textual issues. But since it's come up, I just got to say this because I think it's a very critical issue that we do not accept uh, guilelessly this uh, critical text uh, because so, so many cases, John 8, uh, the, woman is, uh, the woman caught in adultery is not found in the critical text. It is found in the majority manuscripts. Contextually, it absolutely has to be there. So we could go on. I'm not gonna say any more. That's enough for now. Verse um, uh, 36, he answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? So, so you, you get this idea of this man, he's really open. He, he, he wants to, believe on the son of god and, and so he's well who is he that i might believe on him there, there, there's a willingness here unlike the the blind and deaf pharisees that weren't listening even though evidence was overwhelming they just didn't have ears to hear this man is different and so he says um who is he lord that i might believe on him and jesus said unto him thou hast both seen him and it is he that talketh with thee. Isn't it wonderful? Thou hast both seen him. This man spent most of his life and he didn't see anything. But now he's had the, these, this is for the glory of God, right? That miracle is for the glory of God. And that one of the people that he got to see with his own eyes was the son of God. And he said, <laughs> you've both seen him. And it is he that talks with you. And he said, Lord, I like that. Lord, Master, I believe. And it didn't just stop there. It says, and he worshiped him. <clears throat> now, again, the blind man did not worship the Lord until he knew that Jesus was the son of God. And the minute that he knew that Jesus was the son of God, he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. And of course, we would have to say that this man this day not only had received physical sight, but spiritual sight as well. And <laughs> he was doubly made well because he had believed in the only begotten son of God. That's who he believed in and now had life through his name, sight, life. It, he's got good hearing, he's hearing. Uh, I mean, this man is in great shape. He really is. Better shape than he's ever been in his life. He's in what marvelous, marvelous shape. Verse 39, Jesus said for judgment, I am come into the world that they which see not might see and they which see might be made blind. Now this almost seems to contradict prior statements where the Lord said that he's not come to condemn the world. Let's go back and look at John three again, very well known verses. John three, uh, 17, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Now, here's an interesting thing. 
<clears throat> this, the Lord Jesus is saying, I've not come to judge. I've come to save. However, judgment is inevitable for those who ref refuse to believe on his claims. In fact, they're already condemned because they've not believed. But their refusal to believe is really what condemns them. He came to save the world. But if men refuse the pardon, they have to suffer the consequences. Brother in our assembly often likes to use this illustration of the American president, Andrew Jackson. There was a man who was sentenced to the gallows and he was, uh, was issued a presidential pardon before his execution. But this man hated Andrew Jackson. And he said, I refuse the pardon. And uh, he actually, they actually, actually had to take it to the Supreme Court <laughs> because a pardon had been issued. But <laughs> the Supreme Court ruled that to reject the pardon, you have to have the sentence. And so that man died. Very mad at Andrew Jackson, <laughs> yeah, a man who was willing to pardon him. And here, these religious leaders, they're mad at the Savior, the one who came to bring pardon even to them. Earlier on, we, we saw, he said, I say these things to you that you might be saved. Uh, he, he loves the world. He came for all. And the preaching of the gospel has really two effects. Those who admit that they do not see are given sight. They admit that they've been spiritually blind. They admit that they've been wrong. They admit that they, they, they're not, they, they were wrong in their thinking. And they're given sight, but those who insist that they can see perfectly without the Lord Jesus are confirmed in their blindness, which makes belief in him, in his person and work the pivot on which human destiny turns. What will you do with Christ? <laughs> this is the great question, isn't it? What will you do with the one who is the son of God? And so <clears throat> some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, are we blind also? If their eyes had been truly opened, they would too have joined the man who was born blind and acknowledged that he was the son of God and worshiped him. But the very fact that they didn't do that showed that they were blind. He was the one that could see. They were the ones who were blind. Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. If they'd acknowledged blindness, they could have been freed, you see, from sin by believing the Savior. But if they asserted that they could see, then they were really blind. There would be no remedy for them or for their sin. And so this very chapter, it's a very startling chapter in many ways because it, it reveals to us a man who was blind who now could see and people who thought they could see who were really very blind. And sadly, that blindness that was seen in the Pharisees, as the Apostle Paul would tell us brokenheartedly, still is there over much of the Jewish people. Paul would say in Romans 11 that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And so tragically, this man is put out, but the Lord Jesus goes to him and he receives him. And so he's outside the camp, but he's where the Lord is. <laughs> and that's the place to be, isn't it? And isn't that a, a kind of a little kind of picture of what we're going to see unfolding throughout the book of Acts and even into the epistles, that increasingly people are going to be put outside the camp of Judaism, bearing his reproach. They put Jesus, they crucif crucified him outside the camp. And 
we go to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Now let's move in. We're not going to get very far, but I want to read uh, the first six verses of, or consider the first six verses of chapter 10. And again, just to stress the, how important it was for us to, to spend that time in chapter nine, because it really kind of sets the beautiful contrast between blind leaders and the good shepherd. And so this chapter, we know it well, is the good shepherd chapter. It's also the last public discourse of Jesus recorded in the fourth gospel. All the other conversations publicly, in a sense, are going to be, our discussions are going to be with the disciples. Uh, this is the, the last in public in the fourth gospel. Now, <clears throat> I want to do something before we jump into John chapter 10. I want to do another bit of background work. We've seen background in chapter nine, but I want to go to another chapter. And that chapter is in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 34. I want us to go back to Ezekiel 34, because I think it's essential background, really, to John chapter 10. In fact, I never forget, I was at a open platform conference in the north, in Ireland, in a place called Drum, County Monaghan in Northern Ireland. And uh, <clears throat> one of the first speakers was a brother called David Boyd Long. Some of you may know David Long. And uh, he spoke, uh, he got up first and, and uh, he was el he was probably 80, 85, 83, something like that, he was elderly at that stage. But his first uh, opening message of, the, of that conference weekend was a contrast between Ezekiel 34 and John chapter 10. I've never forgotten it. Woe to the shepherds of Israel contrasted with the good shepherd. And interestingly enough, uh, that was an amazing, that's one of the few open platform conferences I've ever been to. But it, there was a theme ripped through that conference. And the theme was the importance of shepherding. And it was absolutely marvelous. You'd have thought somebody had written a script and given it to every participant. Uh, but it was just one of those wonderful occasions. But anyway, Ezekiel 34, I want us to just look at some of the scriptures here because it is a, a, a woe chapter. It's a woe to the shepherds of Israel. And so it says, verse two, son of man prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy, say unto them, thus saith the Lord God to the shepherds, woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves should not the shepherds feed the flock so so the first real indictment is that they had they had really were people that were exploiting the flock rather than taking care of their needs uh they they, they had a selfish motivations they took care of themselves not the flock uh, they were interested in position they were interested in prestige they were interested in power but they weren't really interested in the sheep and so he says, uh, woe to the shepherds of Israel, feed themselves, should not the shepherds feed the flock. You eat the fat, you clothe you with the wool, you kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. And so again, we said that they exploited them. And of course, the Lord Jesus would say to the Pharisees that you devour widows' houses, right? In other words, they were, they were really in it for what they could get from the people rather than what they could give to the people like the true shepherd, like a good shepherd. And <clears throat> notice verse five, it, it tells us that as a result of their, oh, sorry, verse four, the diseased have you not strengthened, neither have you healed that which was sick, neither have you bound up that which was broken, neither have you brought again that which was driven away, neither have you sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have you ruled them. And again, have we not just witnessed this? the way they railed on this man, the way that they, uh, they said, you're a sinner, and they, they just they had negative things to say, and they cast him out. Uh, again, with force and with cruelty, uh, have you ruled them? And they were scattered because there's no shepherd. They became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon all the high hills, so on and so forth. So again, terrible consequences of these 
these wicked shepherds of Israel strayed from God's ways, become food for the wild beasts. That is a picture of the nations. Uh, they became very vulnerable as a result of this kind of leadership. So in the face of that kind of leadership and its failure, the Lord goes on to say that he will become Israel's shepherd. And I want us just to notice that. Let's just break in um, <clears throat> verse 11. For thus saith the Lord God, behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. Well, again, what did we just witness? They kicked this guy out. The Lord Jesus <laughs> went and found him, right? I will search my sheep, seek them out. Uh, <clears throat> as a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep. And will deliver them out of all places where they've been scattered in the cloud, cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the people, gather them from their countries, will bring them to their own land, feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in a good pasture and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. There shall they lie in a good fold and in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock. I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord. I'll seek that which was lost, bring again that which was driven away, blind, bind up them that were broken, strengthen that which was sick. I'll destroy the fat, the strong. I'll feed them with my judgment. So again, this, in contrast, God says, I am going to do it. Now, how is he going to do it? Just look down at verse 23 now. It says, I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. Even my servant David, he shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. My servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken it. Now, could that be that David is mentioned here because he was a prototype or a type the chief ancestor of the messianic shepherd who would come into the world, the Lord Jesus, David's greatest son. And so, again, I believe that it sets the, the scene, this uh, woe to the shepherds. And by the way, uh, it's not incidental. It's, it's quite uh, deliberate. But the Lord Jesus in Matthew 23 virtually repeats this accusation of the shepherds of Israel. Uh, let's just, <laughs> just look at it for a second, Matthew 23. <clears throat> he says, verse 13, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Verse 14, woe unto you. 15, woe unto you. And he goes, it's just like a, a refrain that runs through all this chapter. And the so-called leadership of the nation, the scribes and the Pharisees, the Lord pronounces a woe on them, just as in the book of Ezekiel, uh, through the prophet, uh, God had pronounced woe on the nation of Israel. And so God is going to shepherd them. Uh, he is going to, and that shepherd is going to be this, this glorious descendant of David, he will care for his people. Look at Luke's gospel, chapter one, just for a second, Luke one. Very familiar words in Luke chapter one and verse 31 through 33. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great. And shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom. There shall be no end. So this shepherd ruler going to be in the throne of David. Who's going to care for the flock is none other than the Lord Jesus. Now the other synoptics all speak of the Lord as shepherd. But this particular discourse in John 10 is unique uh, to this place. Although there are other references uh, in the synoptics, we know them well. Let me just look at two of them. 
<clears throat> that we're very familiar with in Matthew's gospel, where the Lord is seen as shepherd of his people. Matthew 9, verse 36. Matthew 9, verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Look at Matthew 15. The Lord could see the plight of his people. Matthew 15 in verse 24. He answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then please, Matthew 18, verses 12 and 13. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth unto the mountain, and seeketh that which is gone astray? If so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine, which went not astray. And so we get this beautiful picture, not only of the Lord being shepherd, we, the Old Testament has the picture of God as the shepherd of Israel. Psalm 80 verse 1, Psalm, Psalm 23 verse 1, the Lord my shepherd, we know these very well. And so as we consider the chapter 10, um, of course, we've got this background in chapter 9. We've got this background of the failure of the shepherds of Israel. We also need to just make some observations about chapter 10. There's really, uh, the chapter divides into two sections. Verses 1 through 21, all takes place right after the man has been cast out uh, by the religious leadership. So it's, it just follows on smoothly uh, from the events in chapter 9. <clears throat> but then there's a second section from verse 22 to the end of, of the chapter, and there's a, there's a gap between them. Notice verse 22. It was at Jerusalem, the feast of dedication, and it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. And so there's at least two months in interval uh, because the previous ones were done at the feast of the connected with the feast of tabernacles, and now we're the feast of dedication. Now, the feast of dedication. Just make mention of that for a moment. Um, that had been instituted. It wasn't one of the feasts of Leviticus 23. It had been instituted 200 years uh, prior to this event, and it was after. Antiochus Epiphanes, if you remember in the book of Daniel, it talked about him and that he was going to offer a sow uh, on the altar, if you remember that, and the temple was defiled. And after that period of the temple being defiled, the temple was rededicated. And so the Jews had added this feast day called the Feast of Dedication, which was to do with the, the rededication after the temple had been cleansed. So back again in chapter 10, we've got these blind leaders in the previous chapter are now going to be contrasted with this good shepherd. So it begins with the words, verily, verily. Now, it's important that, to understand this. Verily, verily, always, it's occurred frequently in John, but it's never starts something. It's always connected with what's gone before. It's always kind of an application of something gone before. Truly, truly, I say to you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. I've got to remind ourselves the original audience would have been very familiar with the, the general picture that's before us. Uh, and even though they understood what Jesus was talking about when he talked about a sheepfold, uh, when he talked about this whole scene, yet they didn't get the spirit spiritual implications. Look at verse 6. It says, this parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were, which he spake unto them. So again, common theme in John's gospel, they can only seem to think at a natural level 
and they can't make that transition to the spiritual. They've had a real difficulty with that all the way through. We're going to have the same problem here. But the original audience would have had no difficulty in understanding the whole pastoral scene that's before us. So what is this sheepfold that he's talking about? Well, it was a, an enclosure that contained several flocks of sheep. Uh, often there might have been a cave behind it or on the side of a house or something. And then you would have built this wall. And this wall had one door to it. But actually, the, the door was, was just a doorway. There was, no, uh, there was actually no gate or anything like that. Because actually, what would happen would be the porter, who happened to be one of the shepherds, would actually lay down in that gap so that he was, in a sense, protecting the fold within. Okay, That's going to be significant as we get further on. Uh, but often there would be several flocks uh, and it would be a, a porter or a night watchman who would guard the entrance. And the next morning, the shepherds would come and they would come and they would receive, uh, the porter would recognize them. And then he would call out his sheep and the sheep would all recognize their shepherd's voice and they would go out and follow them. And so it tells us, Verily, verily, I say to you, he that entereth not by the door to the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. And the implication is, if somebody's there and they're not going through the normal way, through the porter and calling out the sheep, well, they're up to no good. If somebody's climbing over the wall, uh, they, they don't have a good reason for doing it. There's something uh, evil about their intent. And he says... Actually, they're a thief or a robber. And I want to suggest to you that what he has in mind here is the very scene we've seen in the previous chapter, that these religious leaders, self-appointed religious leaders in a sense, have come to God's fold and they've supplanted the place of the real shepherd and they're out to steal and to kill, and to destroy. Uh, they, they don't have a good intent. And of course, interesting how it's written in the singular here. It says, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, it climbeth up some other way. And the implication is that although these shepherds, uh, these Pharisees, these religious leaders, these robbers and thieves, are in the plural, that behind them is a singular individual. Do you remember earlier on, the Lord had said to them, ye are of your father, the devil. And he is the one who has really come to steal, kill, and destroy. But our time has been stolen, and we're going to have to wait till next time to look at the Good Shepherd. Mm -hmm.